Well, good morning and welcome to St. James. What a beautiful morning, a little bit cool, but not a bad way to start the day and start the week. Thank you so much for coming and being with us this day as we gather together to worship. Uh, being observant of the protocols of social distancing and making sure that we do uh, all the right things hygiene-wise, we invite you to please make sure you keep, continue to wear masks, keep social distancing while we are gathered here and also when we are heading back out uh, to the, the parking lot and to our cars. That way we will all be safe for the day. Uh, immediately following uh, the worship service, after the uh, postlude, we will convene the annual meeting of our congregation. Uh, there, the annual reports were at the table where you came in and uh, registered and checked in, and everyone is invited to pick up one of those for uh, one per family. That will provide the materials that we'll be taking a look at uh, as we hear the reports about uh, 2020, the budget for 2021, the uh, recommendations of election of officers for uh, uh, elder, deacon, and also next year's uh, Congregational Nominating Committee, and also to take a look at uh, changing the standing rules of our church and electing a pastor nominating committee. It should, probably should be a relatively brief meeting, uh, although we are also always have the opportunity for any issue appropriate for conversation and discussion and consideration by a congregation at this annual meeting, uh, but I do hope that you'll be able to stay and be with us as we undertake this important task. You'll notice the uh, beautiful flowers here. These flowers that grace our worship are given to the glory of God by Lee Combs and uh, Liz and Allison Schultz, but they are also celebrating the birthdays of uh, Sandy Combs and Nancy Schultz. And we join with them in saying, we celebrate you. Thank you so much for being a part of this family of faith and all that you do. May God bless you on this day and in every day. Let us worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. What shall, we do, what shall we return to the Lord for all the good that God has done for us? We will praise the name of the Lord and bring honor to the name of Jesus. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, you sent Jesus to proclaim your kingdom and to teach us with authority. Anoint us with your spirit that we too may be bring news, good news to the poor, that we may bind up the brokenhearted, that we may proclaim liberty to the captive, and through Jesus Christ our Lord, make your partnership work through what we say and do, that this world may be blessed too. Be with us this day, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Since we've begun the new year, we've been taking a look at how we build great relationships. And we say the Bible's guidance for how to build great relationships, whether that be in our families, with our neighbors, with those with whom we work, or others which we have some engagement with, is the practice of Christian love. We said that Christian love is not just how you feel about the other person, but what you do. It is letting God be in charge, not only to reconcile differences between us, but God will provide us the values, the guidance for which we will be accountable and responsible. The Christian love will offer the same forgiveness that we would hope for so that the relationship can outlast the inevitable hurts that may happen. That we will value the other person as someone who is important to God and of inestimable worth. And finally, to expect God to be involved in our relationships and God's creativity can make possible even what we cannot. Then Paul goes on in the 13th chapter to describe some of the characteristics of this love. And we took a look two weeks ago at that love is patient. That is how we deal with anger and frustration that is inevitably a part of relationships that we have with others. Last week we took a look at the impulse to be kind. That is love in action, responding to the needs of others. Today we take a look at another category. And it's re understanding what is a threat to each and every relationship. The threat that, that Paul highlights here is that selfishness can derail any and every relationship. He puts it this way in verse 4 of chapter 13. He says, love does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. And in these various illustrations, he's just saying that selfishness can make every relationship a contest. When we view and evaluate each relationship out of what do I get out of it? 
And is this something that will be in a cost-benefit analysis to my benefit or to my cost? The relationship has nowhere to go. The challenge of that was highlighted even this last week in the inauguration address by President Biden, in which he said the key thing that we need to have in the country in the coming future is unity. But how do we get unity? How do we turn the perspective from me to we? Well, the Bible gives some guidance about what to do about that. And the, the antidote to selfishness the Bible tells us, is humility. Paul takes some time to discuss that at greater length in his letter to the church at Philippi. And he says these words in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Being born in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord of God, as we take a look at these ancient words, it is our hope that we will also hear your voice speaking to us this day. Touch, renew, and refresh us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the biblical antidote to selfishness is humility. The more we think about it, humility becomes a very elusive virtue. First of all, it's understanding what the Bible means about humility. Oftentimes we think uh, humility is the same thing as humiliation. It is not something in which we minimize ourselves, that we see ourselves as of no worth. It is something that others just have as a license to walk over us and not consider what we need, want, or hope for. It is not the same thing as humiliation. And it's also not the same thing as a sort of just self-disparagement. You know, somebody comes up to me and says, Hey, Tim, I like your tie. And I say, What? This old rag? That's not humility. That's actually insulting the taste of the other person. It's not self-disparagement. It is not being humiliated by others. And it's also and a paradoxical goal, or a paradoxical virtue, in that you cannot make it your goal. It is something that you can fail as soon as you succeed. Just think, boy, today was I humble. I'll bet I was more humble than anybody else. It cannot be the goal itself. It is something that is a byproduct of something else. So what is humility? I think the best way to think about what humility is, is humility is self-forgetfulness. It's not thinking of your ill of yourself, but rather just not thinking of yourself much differently than you're apt to think of anybody else. It's to take as much joy in what others do as you take joy in what you do. It is to see others as equal. As Paul put it there in Philippians, it is not something that is to be treasured. In verses 6 and 8, he says, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he knew who he was. He wasn't disparaging himself. He wasn't minimizing himself. He knew he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being for born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So how does Jesus' example of humility provide us some guidance for how we might become truly humble in our building great relationships with others? 
First, it begins with seeing myself from God's perspective. To know who I am is informed by how God sees me. Paul puts it this way in Romans 12, 3. He says, Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. So how does God see you and me? How does that inform our sense of self? First, God welcomes us and we know that we are members of God's family. God says, you are my sons and daughters. Together, we are a family of faith. We know that we are loved. We are know that we are welcomed. We know that we are treasured. And we know because God says we are welcomed, loved, and treasured, we don't need to go out and find that self-assurance, that self-confidence, that self-affirmation from others. We know who God thinks we are. And though the beginning of that firm foundation of our worth, we also know that I am a forgiven sinner. I am a person who is a member of God's family not because I earned it, or bargained for it. I am a person just like any other who has looked out for my own self-interest. But God says that that's not the end of the story. That the word relationship can outlast even that. It means that I'm aware of my weaknesses, but I also know that God says that's not the end of the story. I'm worth more than that. I am a member of God's family. I am a forgiven sinner. But even more than that, God says he sees in each and every one of us a partner for his continuing good work. He knows that we can make a difference. God wants you to work with him to make this world a blessed place. To see myself from God's perspective knows that God sees and I understand my value that that is something that is something more than just what I've done or have failed to do, and that God sees the possibility in how I can help make this world become all that it is supposed to be. That becomes the foundation of seeing myself from God's perspective. The second thing the Bible says is, out of humility, following the example of Christ, I will be responsive and responsible to others. As Paul begins that passage in verse 4, he says, Look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. I will be responsive and responsible to others. And that can take several different forms. The first is, I make a commitment that I am going to learn from others. That my perspective is not the only view of the world. That I can benefit and learn from other perspectives too. In Proverbs 15, 12, the Bible tells us, conceited people do not like to be corrected. They never ask for advice from those who are wiser. It begins with a, a, an awareness that there is more to the world than just what I see, I hope, and what I want. It begins with a commitment to learn from them. Second, it's also a willingness to admit when I am wrong. To be a knowledge that there are times when I need to be corrected. Again, Proverbs 28, 13 says, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes will never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he will get another chance. I will learn from others. I will admit when I am wrong. But third, I will look out for the best interests of others. As Paul says, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. My commitment is to seek others' welfare as as important as my own. To seek that I will be responsive and responsible to them as they seek what they hope and dream for 
and I am committed to seeking their best interests as much as my own. So I begin by seeing myself from God's perspective, making a commitment to be responsive and responsible to others. But the third is really the key in humility, of self-forgetfulness. You know, you and I are not like computers. We cannot press a delete and a memory is gone. We, we cannot willingly forget something. The more saying, I need to forget that, <laughs> you've reminded yourself in even making that self-instruction. The only way to forget something is to dedicate yourself to something else. I know, when I go to the dentist, the last thing I want to think about is whatever's going on in my mouth. But if I say, just don't think about it, I can't help but think about it. So what, what do I do? I count the dots in the acoustic tile up on the ceiling. You have to have something else to focus on to make it possible to forget. And the key for biblical humility is I will dedicate myself to God's purposes. In my dedication to God's purposes, I have something to, to focus on rather than just, is it to my advantage? How do I come out with it? Jeremiah puts it this way in chapter 9. In verses 23 and 24, he says, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, righteousness on earth. The key to humility is a personal dedication to God and what God shows us is right and true and good and beautiful. And what happens is the focus on that makes it possible for us to fully utilize our capacities without being self-centered. What's the difference between a ball player who is considered by others to be a hot dog and who's somebody who is a team leader? Both of them can be extremely skilled and capable, but one of them uses their abilities to distinguish themselves from others. The other uses his abilities to be able to make the whole team better. And the irony is the dedication to that larger purpose begins to free each of us to fully utilize our capacities and to realize our full potential. To forget ourselves is to focus on something else. And the paradox of humility is that this self-forgiving humility of dedication to God's calling is the key first to self-fulfillment, personal potential, and how we can really have the great relationships that we hope for. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, we give you thanks for we see what you see in us, that you claim us, that you forgive us, and that you invite us to be partners in your good work. We pray, Lord, that in response to that invitation, we will be responsive and responsible to each other. And Lord, we dedicate ourselves to embodying what you say is right and good, to bringing honor to the name of Jesus, and to build the type of relationships both we love and want and need and bring honor to you. Bless us this day, Lord, as we undertake this quest. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Will you pray with me? Loving God, as the rising sun chases away the night, so you have scattered the power of death and fear in the rising of Jesus. You bring us all the blessings in him. Especially we thank you this day for this community of faith in our church as we celebrate what has taken place over the last year and look forward to the future with hope. We give you thanks, Lord, for those with whom we work, with whom we share common concerns, with those with whom we live. We thank you, Lord, for the diversity of our community. For we know, Lord, that unity does not mean that we become all alike, but in a commitment to mutual respect, concern, and humility, that diversity can become a blessing. We thank you, Lord, for the indications of your love at work in the world and for all those who work for reconciliation. Mighty God, with the dawn of your love, you reveal your victory over all that would destroy or harm. Brighten the lives of all. In this day, Lord, we especially pray for families who are suffering separation. Some of us may be divided by distance, some by issues, some by disease or infirmity. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit will bridge those gaps and that it may not defeat us. We pray for people who are different from ourselves and leave ourselves open to learn from them. We pray for those who are isolated by sickness or sorrow, particularly those in this time, Lord, that are impacted by the pandemic. With Nora, we raise before you Brett Hansom in the VA hospital with COVID and pray that your healing grace might be at work in him. We pray for victims of violence, discrimination, or warfare. Lord, you invite us to share what is on our hearts. You already know it, Lord, but we open our hearts to you in confidence that your spirit is discovered at work in our lives. So in the quiet of this moment, Lord, hear our prayers. Thank you, God. Continue to watch over and guide us as we follow your son, Jesus, who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Following the postlude, we will convene our annual meeting. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in this and in every day. Amen.